Einen schönen guten Abend, herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums hier an diesem wunderbaren Ostersamstag. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu unserer Begleitreihe zur Ausstellung Kubricks 2001, 50 Jahre Space Odyssey. Sie finden ja alle Termine zur Begleitreihe im Flyer. Ich möchte Ihnen auch heute schon ans Herz legen, dass wir auch im Rahmen des Osterwochenendes gleich übermorgen am Ostermontag noch einen weiteren Termin haben werden, nämlich David St. Myrowitz hier begrüßen mit seinem Hörspiel der Knochen. Es gibt noch einige Karten, wenn Sie daran interessiert sind, der Eintritt ist frei am Ostermontag um 18 Uhr. Heute freue ich mich aber ganz besonders, dass Sie hier gekommen sind, um Richard Daniels Vortrag zu hören zum Stanley Kubrick Archiv und wir eben dann im Anschluss an die Vorstellung des Vortrags und eine Diskussion dann auch den Film Pass of Glory sehen werden. Ich wechsle jetzt ins Englische für unseren Gast heute Abend. Uh, welcome uh, to the German Film Museum in Frankfurt and welcome to our accompanying series to the exhibition uh, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, 50 Years of a Space Odyssey. Um, tonight's guest is uh, Richard Daniels and he has been the Stanley Kubrick and Senior Archivist at the University of the Arts in London for 10 years, the last 10 years. Um, one could say that without his help and the help of his team, our exhibition, especially on the third floor, would appear uh, quite empty uh, because most of the items of our Jubilee exhibition come from the University of the Arts in London, especially from the Stanley Kubrick archives there. And uh, Richard will tell us a little bit more about uh, this archive, Stanley Kubrick's archive, and um, how it came into being. So uh, Richard, um, to introduce him shortly, has managed the preservation, cataloging and access um, to the University of the Arts London's Archive Centre, the collections, and has also lectured on the life and work of Stanley Kubrick and his archive. Richard gives academic papers, talks and interviews, uh, interviews both in the UK and internationally, and he has also written book and journal chapters, and is co-editor of the acclaimed book Stanley Kubrick New Perspectives, uh, which um, was published uh, in 2015, a book I can um, recommend to you, uh, which includes essays not only by Richard, but also by his co-editors um, Peter Kremer and uh, Luliana, Tatjana, uh, sorry, Tatjana Ljujic, and other um, Uh, papers as well. And um, already in the book, Stanley Kubrick's New Perspectives, he writes about Path of Glory, Stanley Kubrick's fourth feature film from 1957, which we will see tonight. Um, yeah, we will have the, the opportunity to have a, a discussion, a Q&A, if you have some remarks or questions to Richard about his talk and the Kubrick archives afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Richard Daniels. Um, I'll start with an apology. Mein Deutsch is nicht gut, uh, nicht alles as good as mein Wissenschaft von Kubrick. So I'm going to speak in English. It's even worse when I'm nervous. Um, but I thought I'd start with a little setting the scene. So there's a small corner of London town called Elephant and Castle, and standing in the middle of Elephant and Castle is something called the London College of Communication. The building's a 1960s modernist construction of steel, glass, and concrete, fittingly reminiscent of um, the world inhabited by Alex Delage in Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Fitting because the college is now the home to the archive of the film's creator. On the ground floor at the back of one of the college's galleries stands the University of the Arts London's Archives and Special Collections Centre. Safe and secure in its temperature and humidity controlled strong rooms sit an array of archive collections from the worlds of filmmaking, graphic design, sound arts and printing. On the ground floor, uh, in fact, at the, um, at the back of the archive centre itself is the strong room. And the largest collection in that strong room, and by far the most popular collection, obviously, is the Stanley Kubrick archive. It fills, <coughs> sorry, it fills over 800 linear meters worth of archive shelving. A linear meter we kind of count in archive terms as being <coughs> 
a shelf a meter long that will hold between six to eight standard sized archive boxes. So 800 of those, eight boxes in each. It's a hell of a lot of stuff. I think I once tried to calculate it. It comes into the millions of individual documents and items. And the Kubrick archive is not just extensive, but it's comprehensive. Comprehensive in that it contains materials relating to the whole of Kubrick's career. We've got material from um, his first feature film and his early documentaries, his early career as a photojournalist, all the way through to the final film, Eyes Wide Shut. He died very shortly after completing, and posthumous material as well, because the business of being Stanley Kubrick continues after Stanley Kubrick dies. Um, and in many cases, it's comprehensive again because it covers every aspect of the filmmaking process. We've got everything from the development of scripts at the beginning all the way through to the designing of publicity materials. He was heavily involved in organizing the distribution of his films, not doing the designs himself, but picking the designers, picking the quotes that go on the posters. He's just as interested in the business of Stanley Kubrick as he is the art, the creation of Stanley Kubrick. So the Stanley Kubrick archive is essentially the records of the filmmaker's working life. Um, you won't find home movies, you won't find um, personal letters, you won't find things to do with family matters, but scholars, budding filmmakers and fans can learn a great deal about how this master filmmaker created his master works. So what I'm going to try and do, and I'm going to try and do it quite quickly, um, because I've got a lot to get through, is to give you an idea of the contents of the archive. And I'll do that through talking about the way that it's arranged and catalogued. And hopefully, by doing that as well, we'll, I'll give you some insights into new research that has come out from the access that people have had to that archive. So the archive was assembled by Kubrick himself throughout his lifetime. It comes from him. Um, he'd reta he retained a great manner of materials relating to his early works, including letters and paperwork from his very first fiction film, Fear and Desire. By the late 1960s, Kubrick had established himself in the UK and began to work more out of his home in Hertfordshire. And the inevitable consequence of setting up a base so close to the film studios where he worked and often working from home is that the Stanley Kubrick archive contains many more materials from this later period. An obvious jump occurs. There are 21 linear meters of materials for Dr. Strangelove. There are 70 linear meters for the next film he made after that 2001 A Space Odyssey. And since Strangelove was filmed in the UK, but then he moved back to the US where he was living in New York at the time, the material previous from Dr. Strangelove and before then crossed the Atlantic Ocean at least once and the Strangelove material twice. So by the end of his life, in 1999, Stanley Kubrick had assembled a massive archive. And I'm going to play you a very short clip now, um, which will give you a bit of an idea of what it looked like while it was still at his house. Along with this photograph, obviously. As the papers began to show signs of ageing, Christiana Kubrick, his widow, found them increasingly mel melancholic, but she couldn't really get rid of them. To just throw the stuff away would have been like burying Stanley again, she once said. But what could she do with them? And several events occurred bringing the notion that these materials may be of interest to the world beyond the walls of Chigwickbury. This very museum here um, curated the very hugely popular Stanley Kubrick exhibition, which is continuing to tour, um, was last in Copenhagen. As Niels was saying, borrowing the vast majority of the material from, the Kubrick's, uh, from Kubrick's own collection. The exhibition opened in March 2004. Some of you probably went, I don't know. Um, the family also began a long relationship with the, um, uh, with the publication house Taschen, working on the first two books, the Stanley Kubrick archive and the Napoleon book, which is about the, Napo the great Napoleon epic that Kubrick never completed. Uh, both are available in the shop. Bit of a sales pitch. Um, my book isn't. <laughs> um, 
Alongside these projects, the writer and documentary filmmaker John Ronson visited the house and wrote an article about the archive for a national newspaper. And he later developed the ideas into the documentary film Stanley Kubrick's Boxes, which I just showed a very short clip of there. There's much more to it, obviously. So having realised the great interest in the archive, the family started to look for a potential home for it. And serendipitously, the University of the Arts London at the time were looking to establish a new central research and study centre. So what better way to crown this new centre than accessioning the archive of one of the, century, of the 20th century's leading filmmakers? The university made a competitive pitch, promising to establish a secure space in which to protect, preserve and give access to the archive using it not only to encourage research into Kubrick and his films, but the key, I think, is also to inspire new artists to pursue their creative potential to the full. It's a university of the arts. Our students are filmmakers, they're graphic designers, they're makers. And we think that this, is, this kind of inspirational role for the archive is what kind of won university this kind of um, big prize because Christiana Kubrick herself is an artist she comes from a family of artists she raised a family of artists anyway whatever the reason um, an agreement between the major stakeholders was made and in early 2007 the archive was packed up into over 1,000 large packing crates and transported to that archives and special collections center we've just seen Since then, it's a very young me. Since then, the archive has been seen by over 1,800 people, well, between 1,800 and two, over 2,000 people every year. Scholars, art students, journalists, and Kubrick fans have enjoyed delving into Stanley's boxes and the myriad of discoveries they can find. But you don't really want to know about the history of the archive anyway, you want to know what's in it. So hopefully, that's what we're going to get onto. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the work of, what, of, of being an archivist. Um, and so that will give you an insight into the materials in the archive and how these, are, how these materials have been brought to light with new research. So the work of an archivist really bears, kind of boils down to two things. Our job is to preserve archive material and to make it available to people. And those are two conflicting things sometimes, because obviously if you make things available to people, they're likely to get damaged if you preserve them. Uh, but the best way to preserve an archive is to freeze it. And it's pointless because nobody can access it. So my constant job for the last 10 years, other than advise people on copyright, has been to make those decisions about how to make things as accessible as possible whilst not damaging it. Um, and one aspect of that is cataloguing. Um, and an essential aspect of cataloguing an archive is arrangement. And we archivists have one really important kind of pillar, principle, when it comes to archival arrangement. It's called original order. We try as much as possible with an archive collection to maintain the order in which the creator either created his archive or the way that they used it. This is so much easier with an institutional archive when we're talking about an organization with different departments that create standard types of records that go in standard filing systems. Um, it's not so easy with a person, an individual, certainly not an individual who's an artist, even when that individual as an artist is well known for his attention to detail, his archival cataloging wasn't really that great. And since he died, I think the archive came Eight years after he died as well, a lot of people had been through the archive. A lot of things had happened to it since then. So it was quite difficult, really, to get to grips with how the archive was originally put together. In order to prepare the archive for transfer, a rudimentary organisation of the materials took place at the house. But in the years since its arrival at the university, professional archivists, including myself, learning more about the contents of it and its history, talking to family members, people who worked with Kubrick, talking to our researchers who spend much more time looking at the material than we ever do and studying the materials ourselves. We've come together, we've basically been able to kind of create an idea of something close to an original order. Um, we've refined, developed, and on many occasions actually completely changed that preliminary organization that took place before it came to us. The general principle is, or a general principle is, once Kubrick had finished a film, he took all of the stuff that was in his office, stuff is a very technical archival word, um, 
and pack them into boxes and set them to one side. So the core principle of the archival arrangement with the Kubrick archive is that every, all of the materials related to the initial development, production and release of an individual fe feature film are kept together. And anything outside of that is kept in a separate personal and business papers section or, or, or other feature, uh, featured in other areas. And so within each film section, you have material related to the development, the production, the um, post-production, the distribution, and the press material coming back for those individual films. As I say, this leaves a separate personal and business papers section where materials not specifically related to the individual films or contemporary to their initial release are organised. Here you can find bits of Kubrick's memorabilia as well. We've got luggage tags for sea voyages across the Atlantic, uh, membership cards of various different organisations. He was a massive fan of stationery, so there's headed note paper, filing types, um, stationery catalogues. Here are also letters and correspondence outside of the film production. And here you can see a letter um, from Kubrick to the author John le Carré, whose real name is David Cornwell. I don't know how easy that is to read, at the, particularly at the back, but I'll read it anyway. Um, it's a really good display of Kubrick's character and manner. So in response to the author that, um, sending him a copy of his book, The Night Manager, we think, Kubrick replies, Dear David, I love the book as I have loved all of your work. And he continues, it's great to have a book you want to get back to and know it's there each day. Unhappily, the problem is still pretty much as I fumbled and bumbled it out to you on the phone yesterday. Essentially, this is very Kubrick. How do you tell a story it took the author 165,000 words, my guess? Oh, sorry, 165,000, my guess, good and necessary words to tell with 12,000 words about the number of words you get to say in a two-hour movie based on 150 words speaking rate, less 30% silence and action, without flattening every, everybody to gingerbread men. I am very flattered and grateful you let me read the MSS, the, the manuscript, so, uh, uh, so early on. I don't suppose you want moronic logic of the audience feedback on any plot points, so none offered. Kasparov does not need the comments of the kibitzers. Best regards. P.S. Your fax number is old, and I would rest easier if someone acknowledged the receipt of this fax. This is very, a very kind of indicative of the character of Kubrick. It's very personal, very friendly, and at the same time shows a little bit of that kind of systematic mind and that kind of obsession for details, the estimating how many words would go into the film, how many words there must be in this book. Also, to me, it's enlightening because the book that this is about is significantly shorter than The Shining, making us think that Kubrick possibly didn't think that very much of The Shining were good and necessary words. <laughs> um, so on to the individual film sections. So the first breakdown within each individual film section is development. And development holds all the treatments and screenplays for the film. Again, true to the original order, um, this series actually holds all screenplay materials, not just the things related, not just the items related to the development of the film, but also post-production scripts to do with editing and release scripts as well. And that's because when we looked at the boxes, you would see a series of ten boxes, and they just say Clockwork Orange scripts. And inside those boxes, there was all of this material, and actually they weren't in any order either. So a little bit of um, archival management took place. In most, of the, in most of them these days, we've tried to organize them chronologically so you can get an idea of the development of the film through that. This is very hard to do when you get kind of slips of paper that don't have any dates on them on their own, or you have several bound copies of scripts that are all dated exactly the same, but are obviously different. Um, however, we've done the best we can. So here in the scripts, you can see the ideas first coming together. Um, you can discover where the ideas come from, too. Um, and so this particular piece is a note card from Full Metal Jacket. Um, in the corner here is actually a photocopied extract from the original novel, which is called The Short Timers by Gustav Hasford. Um, oh, I've got a pointer, actually. 
There we go. I didn't really need to do that, did I? Um, these cards are in a kind of general scene order, but it's very early on in the process, so actually it doesn't resemble the scene order of the film as it, uh, as it finish, uh, when it finishes. Um, when we look at the source novels and how they were used in Kubrick's films, we find that a great deal of the dialogue actually is taken directly from those source novels. And so this particular piece here, again, this is probably easier to read than the other one, but it reads, Come one, come all, to exotic Vietnam, the jewel of Southeast Asia. Meet interesting people of an ancient culture and kill them. Be the first kid on your block to get a confirmed kill. So here in the novel, he's talking about an article that he wrote. This is the character Joker. Um, and obviously, the, those of you that know the film, it's probably all of you, otherwise why would you be here? Um, uh, the, context changes for the, the context changes for the film. Is Joker is actually speaking to a TV crew about why he wanted to go to Vietnam himself. So hopefully we have a second clip which will cover that. I didn't give enough warning on that one, did I? While we're waiting for the clip, I'll just say there are two more interesting facts about the note card um, when we compare it to the film. You can see at the bottom here, Joker is ordered to journalism school. The smoking lamp is lit. And at the top, it says Gerheim, page 45, uh, meet interesting people and kill them. Now, Gerheim was the original name of the drill instructor in the scripts for the, um, for the film. So, obviously, it... In this early stages, Kubrick is actually thinking about using this section of text in a completely different part of the film to the bit that we're about to see when we see the clip. This is indicative of the way that Kubrick worked or how the, the way that the archive shows us Kubrick worked. Ideas come from all over the place. He gathers them together. He makes note of them in lots of places, but he doesn't always really know what he wants to do with them until he's actually making his film. Um, and often ideas will float around for a while, go away and come back again. Another really good example is the bathroom scene in A Clockwork Orange. You, you all know it. Alex is laid back in the bath and he starts singing, I'm singing in the rain. And that's what makes the writer realize that the boy that he's just kind of rescued from this government treatment is also the, the boy that um, caused the death of his wife. So now Kubrick had written in a bathroom scene in an earlier version of the script. But I don't know if you, you probably know the story that the singing in the rain part in the rape sequence in Clockwork Orange was actually ad-libbed by Malcolm McDowell. After days and days of trying to get this scene right, Kubrick said to him, can you, can you sing? Can you dance? And he said, yeah, sure, and started to do the singing in the rain. So, so this iconic scene of that film was really made up on the spot while they were shooting. At which point, later on, really, in the development of the film, Kubrick was thinking, how do I create um, the knowledge, basically, in the writer's head of who Alex is? And so he revives this bathroom scene, which he had in earlier and had rejected and taken it out of the media, middle scripts and puts it into those later scripts. So we see this quite a lot, changing of minds, having new ideas, um, and just gathering information from other places. This is another draft script section from um, uh, Full Metal Jacket, and it brings us another revelation regarding Kubrick's thoughts on Full Metal Jacket particularly. This is called E-Script Notes, and you can read on the third and fourth paragraphs, or you probably can't because it took us ages to decipher it. It's another key archival skill being able to read handwriting. This is Stanley Kubrick's handwriting. Um, so hang on, I can't translate it from here either. So here's one I preferred earlier. There should be a, Viet there should be a Vietnamese character to, to summarize the Vietnamese position. We totally lack a Vietnamese point of view. And then this next one here, but even harder to read. Uh, could Rafter be a Vietnamese? Could there be a Choi Hoi turncoat scout, a Kit Carson who Joker could talk to in Hue? And Choi Hoi was the name for the propaganda used by the Americans and the South Vietnamese to try and get Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops to defect. 
And Kit Carsons were these kind of defectors who were then used as scouts in the areas where they used to act for the North. Um, so Kubrick was initially worried about the lack of a Vietnamese presence in his film and thought up a few ways in which Vietnamese, the Vietnamese could tell their own story in his film. And in the end, though, he doesn't use any of these ideas again. Uh, this raises a question to me, did he overcome this lack of a Vietnamese point of view or did he overcome his anxiety about not having a Vietnamese point of view in the film? Oh, what did I do there? Ah, uh, phew. <laughs> Uh, for Lolita, we also have this most interesting document. It's called Quigley's Suggestions. And Martin Quigley was basically uh, one of the founders of something called the Production Code in the 1930s. And that was, in the US, the set of rules, guidelines, moral guidelines by which the film industry um, followed in order to um, create moral films that would be able to be released in the, um, in the cinemas. The film industry basically self-censored itself in order to avoid being state-censored. And Kubrick and his friend and um, business partner Jimmy Harris hired Martin Quigley to basically go through an existing script of Lolita and give his opinion about which bits would or wouldn't get through the production code. So they're preempting issues that they know might come up. And this document here is basically a memo from Jimmy to Kubrick. And we see Kubrick's suggestions not Kubrick, sorry, Quigley's suggestions here, and then Jimmy's comments underneath. Um, here's a few choice segments from the first section, from this first page. It's a four-page document, I think. Here we go again. Page, 80, page 85. Thinks we are insulting the police unnecessarily. We can defend this very easily by explaining potential danger to Humbert with police present, not an insult. And then below it, page, 80, page 86. Objection to Lolita's speech. The word is incest. Suggests using word adultery. I believe he is right, recommending making this change. Now this is just some of the ways that the development section can give us new insights into the way that Kubrick worked. Um, the next section, pre-production. Um, often the largest part of any film section in the archive. It's where all of the material generated in the order to plan and execute the shoot is located. Here you'll find extensive location research, sometimes historical research, some set design, concept artwork, and even the odd storyboard. Location research like this one here is one of the largest sections for most parts of the archive. Um, this is part of what is actually a much, much larger panoramic photograph of Commercial Road in London. And Kubrick sent his location researcher, who luckily is also his nephew on this film, Manuel Harlan. And Manuel took a set of stepladders and basically walked the entire length of Commercial Road. It's a very, very long road. Um, climbed up to the stepladders, took a photograph, climbed down, moved along another metre or so, climbed up, took another photograph, came down. In a day, did the whole road, went off had the photographs processed, stuck them all together so he could take them to Kubrick so Kubrick could look at them and see whether it would be possible, well, Kubrick and his art department, whether it's going to be possible to dress these shops to make them look like New York enough so that it can do one long trafficking shot. And Manuel did this both for Commercial Road and another road called Hatton Gardens. In the end, the shot was done at Hatton Gardens. A huge labour-intensive job it is being a location researcher for the likes of Stanley Kubrick. Anybody want to guess where this is from? Sorry? Oh, I wrote it on the bottom. <laughs> oh, well, giving the game away. Let's, okay, so for, his, for Kubrick's historical films, Paths of Glory, Spartacus, Full Metal Jacket, and Barry Lyndon, uh, he made a lot of historical research in order to understand the topic and context of the stories, not just to understand the stories themselves. For the latter two, much of that research remains. The pre-production section of Barry Lyndon contains thousands of pictures, some torn out of history and art books and magazines, others copied from various sources, museums, libraries. Many of them are organised into folders on specific subjects, including German landscapes, prisons and torture. Um, take this piece, for instance. A photograph of an 18th century painting kept in the folder entitled Inns and Coffee Shops. 
And on it, we can see two interesting features. Here you've got, again, Kubrick's handwriting. Small pictures high on the wall. So little memoranda, little ideas about how the sets might look if we have an inn or a coffee shop in our film. This is so early on as well that there's half a script. And the script for Barry Lyndon takes so, goes through so many different guises that there are scenes added, taken away, added, taken away, and extra ones. And reams of blank pages where it just says um, various activities that he's going to come up with later. Um, the other thing is we've got this raffle ticket here. Most of them are numbered, either with a raffle ticket itself or it's a photocopy with a number. And this is basically a form of librarianship, a form of indexing. We know that copies of these pictures were used in several folders. We also know that it's, or it's probable that several copies of individual folders were made for other members of crew. And so it allows you to say, look at page, two, look at page 260, because look at the Hogarth. Stanley, there are 20 Hogarths in my file. The one with the blue socks. Stanley, my file is all black and white. It gets over those issues. One interesting revelation about this historical research for Barry Lyndon, it's, it's pretty well known that Kubrick did a lot of picture, um, visual research looking at the 18th century paintings, but actually once we look into the archive, we also see that 19th century pictures, portraiture is used often, particularly for looking at the way that mood is composed, and the 17th century is heavily relied upon for lighting. So books specifically about lighting effects tend to be full of paintings by 17th century Dutch, Dutch masters, including this one by Vermeer. Full lighting effects, just in case you didn't realize. So here's a couple more. With our bath gown and the Brady family. Historical research for Full Metal Jacket includes visual research such as photographs, especially pages of photojournalism torn out of books and magazines. See these two marked up with features of interest. Hundreds of photographs of adverts from 1960s Vietnamese newspapers were also copied from microfilms and used as inspiration for the billboards that were built to hang up on the sets to make it look like Vietnam. Um, and also cultural material, including a large collection of jokes popular um, among American soldiers during the period to aid the script writing. For 2001 A Space Odyssey, I've tried not to put too much in about 2001 because you've got an entire exhibition upstairs that can tell you all of this. But for 2001 A Space Odyssey, obviously the research is very different. We're not talking about historical research, we're talking about trying to work out what will the future look like. And not just having an art department imagine what will the future look like, but talk to NASA, talk to the companies that are working with NASA, talk to Parker Penn about what they think their pen of the future will look like, talk to IBM about what computers are going to be doing by 2001, all of that. But as I say, it's all upstairs, you should go and see it. Pre-production also includes some, but not many, set designs, um, such as these. There's one here for Full Metal Jacket on the left, and one for Eyes Wide Shut. We also find concept artwork, but again, very little. Um, and finally, even even less prevalent are storyboards. We tend to find storyboards only for sequences requiring a lot of special effects, such as the Alice's Dream sequence, that's what these are for here, from um, Eyes Wide Shut, um, and for uh, AI or artificial intelligence, and there's some really nice storyboards again upstairs in the exhibition for the spaceship sequences for 2001 A Space Odyssey. There are no storyboards at all for live action. Kubrick didn't use them. Um, this dream sequence obviously wasn't shot in the end. Um, and if you look through the whole of them, I think we can work out why. I think Nicole Kibben probably looked at them and said, there's no chance. Not unless you pay me double. And there's no chance that Kubrick is going to pay anybody double. Now, he didn't use storyboards. Oh. Hang on, sorry, 2001 storyboards. These are upstairs, aren't they? <laughs> um, he didn't use storyboards very often, but he did use maquettes. 
um, to plan sets and to plan shots. And these are just a few of hundreds of photographs in the archive detailing all of the maquettes of the sets for The Shining. Built, built to test the lighting, they were all built by the cinematographer um, on the film and to plan shots. See the very cinema cinematic photograph here of the kitchen where somebody's got up really close to a tiny cardboard model to make a shot. Here also maquettes for Full Metal Jacket, again testing lighting. Um, but this one on the left um, has an added dimension. A model street scene has been created using cardboard or wood and toy soldiers and jeeps. It's then been filmed on a video camera played back onto a television and photographed on the television. And um, we think this is probably part of the planning for TV release. So by the mid 1980s, obviously home video is a massive market and Kubrick spends a lot of time corresponding with the Warner home video department. There's an entire department of it. And so what he's doing here is making sure that whilst the cinematic vision is still a widescreen vision, once it's cropped down to television, none of the essential visuals are lost. So, moving on to the production section. The production phase includes the mass of bureaucratic documentation created in order to keep track of filmmaking. Uh, there's items such as call sheets, continuity reports, vast amounts of files of camera negative reports, which are basically just receipts from labs to say that they've received some film and they've processed it. Um, to the casual eye, these are very dull documents, but to the film researcher, they can be valuable resources. Particularly call sheets, progress reports, and continuity reports record a great many details about the production. What was filmed on what day, who was there, when, um, where they were, what happened, what was used. Um, and there are also the odd graphically interesting items such as this one. And this page is taken from a continuity script. Um, the continuity girl on Lolita, her name is Pamela, Pamela Davies, and in those unenlightened times they used to call them continuity girl. These days it's usually script supervisor, um, although the role tends to still be women. Um, the script supervisor stands by the director and records what takes place during every take. With this particular one, she's got a She's actually got a copy of the script and she's standing next to it and drawing a line from the moment that Kubrick says action to the moment he says cut. And then she writes in shorthand little notes and then later on she'll go and write those up into reports. So with continuity reports you basically get blow for blow everything that was shot on every day using what camera, what lens, um, when Kubrick said cut, why he decided to stop the shot, whether he decided to print it or not. And so we get an idea of what was going on. And here, because also her job, continuity, is to make sure that if they have to go back and do it again, they've got the right camera, the right lens, but also the shots look the same. So what she's been doing here, obviously, is she's been recording which of Sue Lyon's fingers have already got um, nail varnish on them for the scene where Humbert Humbert is painting her nails in order to make sure that if they do it again, they're made up properly. Production is also where we find props and costumes. And you can see here a prop newspaper from A Clockwork Orange. Interesting fact about these is you can see that obviously the headline, the subheading, and the main large text here all relate to the film story. And also the photographs obviously are the characters from it. But from underneath here, all of the text is actually a completely different article. And that's because Kubrick and his team are using the Daily, Ma the Daily Mail's printing presses of the day and they're basically just cutting in as much as they need for it to come across on the film. So on the film, they're not going to see this small print, so it doesn't really matter. We don't need to write something and have something new. So that's just basically what was the news of the day when these were made. And on the right-hand side, we can see Tom Cruise's driving license with a very obvious deliberate mistake. Well, I think it's deliberate. Somewhere around here, there is height, 5 foot 10. <laughs> He's, I think he's something like five foot six, five foot four. I don't know. He's a dwarf, isn't he? Um, the stories of him having to use raised shoes on Interview with a Vampire because he was um, felt um, inferior to Brad Pitt. Then we have post-production. Post-production is populated by materials related to the editing of the films. Recording and adding soundtracks and managing the production of dubbed versions for the European market. 
Here, for some films, you'll find Kubrick's cutting notes. Again, hugely valuable items. On the screen, you can see music cue sheets for Clockwork Orange, and post-production tends to be the area where we find the most material related to music in his films. And again, it's one of those weird things where music is obviously really important to his films for us as what, when we watch it. But it doesn't create a huge amount of documentation, so researchers coming in who want to know about the music in his films, it's there, but there's not a lot, and it takes quite a lot of mining and quite a lot of cross-referencing to, um, to get something out of it. Then we have distribution. Distribution consists of the materials related to the marketing and the release of the films. Here you'll find press releases, correspondence regarding release schedules, poster art development, press packs and press books, and other documentation regarding the use of quotes in the films. This here, if you can't tell, is a press pack for Dr. Strangelove. Cunningly disguised as a prop from the film, Special Attack Plan R, Top Secret. Inside, the journalist will find um, photos of the main stars, biographies of those stars, a breakdown of the plot of the film, all the information that this person needs in order to write an article, to write an intro to the film without even actually having to go and see it. And it's all jazzed up so that, I mean, I think this is, you know, deliberate that the first thing this journalist does when he comes in in the morning and looks at his desk, he's got a pile of invitations and one of them says top secret. Which one is he going to open first? I know which one I'd open first. That's why I'm an archivist. On top of this lovely, wonderful kind of film pro um, production process order that we've created, there's then always anomalies with archival arrangement. And we come across series of files, boxes of documents that don't fit neatly into this organization that we've created for them. And in order, again, to keep that original order, we keep them separate. We, we tend to call them index papers. Um, here is all manner of different items, mainly correspondence documenting the process of production and sometimes the limitations faced by the director. Here you'll find correspondence between Kubrick and some of the stars he worked with, such as Peter Sellers. Also correspondence with co-writers, such as Arthur C. Clarke, which can inform us further how the films were developed. Um, documents related to all aspects of filmmaking. This particular one, you can see from here, is a letter from the manager of the Timberline Lodge, which is the hotel in Oregon that the exterior of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining is entirely based on. Um, much of it is pleasantries. It was so great to have Jan Harlan over doing the films. Thanks for looking after me while I was in London, blah, blah, blah. But the manager asks Kubrick one particular um, question. Somewhere around here, I won't find it really. Um, it says, it is very probable that once the movie is released, we might have serious difficulties renting our room 217, as some of our guests could be afraid of being chased by the bloated body of the bathtub lady. If at all possible, Dick would like you to change the number 217 to 237, 247 or 257, neither of which exists at the Timberline Lodge. And above in Kubrick's hand, here, you can see him informing, he's basically writing on it to send it on to Roy and Jan. Now, Roy Walker is the um, production designer, the art director, sorry, on the film, and Jan Harlan is the person we just saw previously, Kubrick's brother-in-law, executive producer. Um, um, and he's basically saying, change the number accord, please, can you change the room number accordingly? And then he writes his reply. This is, this is often the way. So with the incoming note, Kubrick writes in hand what the response should be and hands it to a secretary who types it up. Um, so yeah, here at the bottom, he says, um, thank you, something, I can't read it from this angle, but room 237, best, Stanley. So I don't know if any of you have watched, there's a film called Room 237, which is full of conspiracy theories about the real meaning of The Shining, and some of them hang around this decision to change the room number, and that Room 237 somehow is linked up to all of these kind of numerical maths that Kubrick was going through in his head before he made that decision. And here we see the evidence that actually that room number was suggested by the hotel manager of the Timberline Lodge. I mean, it could be, he's, off, he's given three options, he picks one of them, it could still be a Kubrick decision, but it starts to kind of 
make a monkey out of these ideas that somehow the room number is, is, is you know, some kind of important decision. Um, in these index papers as well, you often find fan letters, and fan, um, fan letters tended to be organised geographically, so by the country and then by the town from which the letter came from, rather than by the people. Um, they, they can be fascinating. I'm particularly in awe of the man that sends a self-addressed envelope after seeing Clockwork Orange and demands his money back, saying, Stanley, a burn is a burn. Somehow he, he kind of claims how wonderful both Dr. Strangelove and 2001 were and he can't believe that he can have made such a film as A, Co a Clockwork Orange. This is, is another one of my favourites. Dear Mr. Kubrick, I've just seen your movie 2001 A Space Odyssey and liked it very much, except the ending. I couldn't make head nor tails out of what it was or what it meant. Could you please explain it to me? Sincerely yours, Gerald D. Franklin. P.S. I'm 10 years old, my parents are fairly intelligent, and they couldn't explain it to me. <laughs> Attached to it actually is a copy letter from Kubrick's secretary saying, Kubrick is very busy at the moment, but he will write back to you. And we, unfortunately, we don't know whether he actually ever did. You know, he's quite famous for not explaining his films, although there is certainly in this early part of his career, he did respond to fan letters and sometimes he responds positively. When somebody sends him an interpretation of 2001, he says, that's really great. Well done. Um, we also have a huge amount of publicity. Kubrick was interested in getting hold of copies of all of the adverts, also his reviews, um, and all of that was all kept together. For many of the films, we also hold awards and correspondence about award campaigns. There are sections, called, uh, sections for financial papers. Usually financial papers have their own section. And they include things like um, below the line budgets, that's budgets that don't include producer director fees, cost comparisons between film productions. So he can go and say how much, particularly when, the, when there starts to be big gaps between him making films, he then goes and makes, gets comparative budgets from films that are out at the time to find out how much people are spending at the moment on equivalent type Hollywood pictures. Um, finance is ever present across the Kubrick archive. He is obsessed with bringing a film in on budget if possible and making money. And that's one interesting thing that is often lost in the way that people talk about Kubrick. They talk about him as being some kind of artist filmmaker who is, you know, a, kind of a highbrow artist, but actually he's also a Hollywood film producer who wants to make money. Um, and that's an interesting factor. There's also a large amount of photographs, um, behind the scenes um, stills, official press stills, Uh, transparencies and slides add a bit of colour. In some film sections, there are also collections of personal snapshots taken on set and in the production offices, and documenting the work going on to make each film. Uh, the creators of these personal pho photographs are unfortunately long since forgotten. There's 30 boxes of photographs just for 2001 A Space Odyssey, which again kind of belies this lie that goes around that nobody was allowed to take a photo on 2001 A Space Odyssey. There were five official stills photographers that worked on 2001. There's also material um, for the unfinished project. So here's some location research for Aryan Papers, which was the film um, based on a novel called Wartime Lies, set during the Holocaust that Kubrick was trying to make in the 1990s. This lady here, this is one of about, well, one photograph from one file. There are five folders of costume tests. Johanna de Stige is a, <clears throat> a Dutch actress who was hired to, well, not even hired in the end. She was cast to play the main part in the film, brought over to England, made to try on hundreds and hundreds of different costumes and photographed over at Jan Harlan's house and then sent home and said, wait, we'll call you. And then... She didn't hear anything for a long, long time, and then eventually she gets the, photo, the phone call to say the film's not happening. Also, AI, there's a large amount of material again for AI, including, this is probably the largest amount of graphic material that we've got, the concept artwork that was done by um, Chris Baker, who uses the pseudonym Fangorn here, um, for AI. 
Uh, there's also a lot of material for the Napoleon Project, which you can see in the book that's in the shop. That's not yet in the archive, so I can't talk too much about it. It's still over with the family at Chigwickbury. And that... Was that in, in time? I don't know. That was, anyway, a quick flash tour of the Stanley Kubrick archive. 800 linear metres in 30, 40 minutes. Thank you, Richard, for your talk. Are there any questions, remarks to Richard Daniels? Okay, I see one over there. Yes, thanks very much for the lecture. I have two questions. Uh, one is referring to the artwork in uh, on the Eyes Wide Shut storyboard. Yeah. Uh, who did the artwork? Do you know? Or did and how? Or same story for AI. Uh, my question would be: um, How can you tell us anything about the process? Kubrick talking with a special artist, or so on. And the second question is talking about finance. Uh, could you give us an? how can I say that, an estimate or a feeling, um, how much money did he make on some kind of movie and how much did the actors get? Ooh. Or he himself, do you know? He himself, no, not really. I mean, I've got an idea. I can give you general ideas. I couldn't give you figures because, and also they changed. Each film is different. Um, so we start with the, 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 the artwork. Actually, for both of those films, for Eyes Wide Shut and for AI, the artist is a guy called Chris Baker, who was a kind of fantasy novel illustrator. He, and this is why he uses this name Fangorn. Fangorn is the name of a forest from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, and Chris Baker, Kubrick hired to work on AI first, I think, and he liked his work, so... He then hired him to work on Eyes Wide Shut. He had another Chris. In fact, there was at least three Chris's involved in the AI project altogether. And I've completely forgotten his name at the moment, but a, quite a famous comic book artist. And he drew, did a, a couple of drawings of vehicles. And we've got one really nice, there's a drawing from him. His name will come back to me in half an hour. Um, uh, and then there's a note from Kubrick saying, after all of this time, just one well kind of put together drawing and another kind of sketchy sketch or something. And I can't remember the exact words, but he's basically saying to this guy, you need to get your act together because this isn't enough. You're not doing enough quickly enough, which is quite hypocritical from a man who took years to make his films. As far as costs are concerned, it varies. And I mean, we know that 2001 ran heavily over budget and to a point where MGM was starting to get a bit worried about what were they letting themselves into. But we also know that it was hugely successful. There's a myth that goes that, that's around these days, which is that 2001 wasn't popular until a group of hippies started going and smoking weed in the front and watching the special effects sections, but it's nonsense. It was released initially in Cinerama, so that meant it, had, it could only go into limited cinemas. In big cities, they had these big Cinerama screens, and it was... These were kind of like big family type events. It were, the films that they would show were like the, the way the West was won. Um, and outside of that, it was like what you get these days with... What's the big cinemas called now? IMAX. IMAX, man. thank you. Yeah, like an IMAX. And so when they don't have a big feature film on, you, you're watching like Walking with Dinosaurs or A Trip Down the Nile, those kind of experiential films. It was sold out before it had even been released, 2001. And it continued to be before it had a national release. And people pick out like specific critics who were down on the film. But actually, if you look at the reviews across the board, across the whole of the US and across the rest of the world, it was generally taken as a positive film. You look at the fan letters, people came out of that film moved by it, you know. And, and that's, that's something that you don't get from this kind of myth about 2001. Oh, I was supposed to be talking about finance though, wasn't I? Sorry, money, money. So 2001 made a fortune in the end. And that's partly the reason why Warner Brothers picked him up for Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange cost a pittance and made Warner Brothers an absolute fortune. And Kubrick did quite well out of that film, not, not brilliantly. Um, but it's, it, Clockwork Orange basically established the relationship with Warner Brothers that he kept from then on. So they were the film studio he went back to. They kind of basically said, oh, it's a Kubrick film. Here you go. Take the money. Do what you like. It will return. And then came Barry Lyndon. 
And Barry Lyndon was a flop. In Barry Lyndon, Paris outsold the whole of... It is incredible. It's awful. These terrible people. Um, Paris outsold the whole of the US and the UK market put together. And at the end of the day, from a film um, company's point of view, you need to make your money back in the first two weeks in the US alone for a film to be marked as successful. And yeah, so Paris outsold the whole of the US over the entire period of time. So that's a kind of a black mark on him, which is probably one of the reasons why he then went for The Shining, because late 70s horror films are really popular. And again, The Shining didn't cost a huge amount to make, made a fortune. And that, and that was kind of like the film that then set him on a steady path of, of comfort. He bought a nice big new house, moved in to this manor house and filled it full of boxes so that nobody could move. Um, did that kind of generally answer the question? And he himself, I don't know. Not as much as your George Lucas's or your Steven Spielberg's, which he was always a little bit upset about, but enough to have a comfortable life in a big house in Hertfordshire and not have to ever worry again about money. Yeah? <laughs> okay, here's another question. Come on. So thank you very much for your lecture. It was very like interesting. That. I would like to hear it again, maybe on another occasion. So uh, I oh, would like to know... Are you filming? <laughs> yeah, it's so full, so rich. So uh, I would like to know, was it a team? Because I think it's a very difficult work to do. Were you several persons? Yeah. How did you get the uh, know-how? Maybe very briefly. And then I would like to know, I didn't understand what you said about this dream scene. Uh, why was it not uh, oh, the dream provide, sequence. because it was so expensive? And then is there any other director who was so um, much obsessed about detail? Maybe you are obsessed as well. Huh? Ah. Yeah. Um, so yes, yes, it's a team. I um, For the cataloging project as a whole, it's been done over s well, many years, from 2008 till it's still happening now, it's still continuing. And for that, for various projects, we hired separate archivists. But on top of that, my full-time team has always been myself, one other full-time qualified archivist and a full-time archives assistant. It's a bit weird. So in archives, you have to work for an archive in a, for a year before you can go on to do the qualification, the master's degree, before you can then claim that you're a qualified archivist. So we've always had an archives assistant who is training with us before they go on to become full-time archivists. And that was my team, and that wasn't enough. Given the amount of people that came in, the amount of use the, the university had from it, I could have done with at least two more full-time archivists just to get, um, you know, get it going. Um, sorry, the second question. So this dream sequence, basically, it's very sexy. There's a lot of sex and there's weird groping hands coming out of grass. Um, there's certain parts where, the, where Alice is actually having sex on a horse. Um, so it's more an imagination rather than the truth. I don't know what the real reason is why they didn't shoot it, but I can imagine that Nicole Kidman looked at the drawings and thought there's absolutely no way that I'm going to do this unless you pay me a lot more money. And uh, the joke is that actually Kubrick was so tight with the way that he paid, going back to this budget thing, what he paid other people. I mean, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman signed up to do a Kubrick film. They weren't paid like a daily rate or a monthly rate or something like that. They were paid a flat fee. And then they lived for a year in, in, in the UK. And they didn't get more money because the shoot took a year when it was only supposed to take 12, 16... I think it was supposed to be a 16-week shoot or something. You, an idiot to think that a Kubrick shoot is going to be 16 weeks, but that's what the original production schedule is. And, and they lived for a year in London, so they probably didn't make anything out of it in the end. I don't know. I'm not... I'm not certain because there are no other archives out there in the public domain as big or as accessible as that. I know there's a, there's a story in, there's a really great documentary about the making of Blade Runner called Dangerous Days. And there's a bit where a props guy has a nervous breakdown or had a nervous breakdown on set because Ridley Scott asked for yet another coffee cup because he didn't like the 50 that he'd already brought. Um, and I, th I think you find that kind of tenacity in getting it right from a lot of directors. But every director's different. So Ridley Scott is really interested in the image and making the image right. Kubrick also, but actually Kubrick is a lot more flexible in the way that he does it. He will just keep shooting it and keep shooting it and move things around and change things in order to do it. Um, yeah. Um, There's not really an answer to your question. I think the answer is I'm not sure. 
Okay, I fear our, there's one more question, but our time is up for the moment. So, uh, Richard, we'll be around after the screening, also yeah. answering questions, comments. Uh, Richard will be around in the foyer afterwards. So, we will now start with the screening of Path of Glory. So, my final question, obvious question, is why did you choose Path of Glory for our accompanying series? Because you told me I had to pick something short. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean... I it could have been another uh, yeah, move so, from the early period. I mean, partially it was because you, you wanted me to pick something short. Partly, um, I, do a, I used to do a lot of these kind of things, a lot of screenings, a lot of talks and things, and I've seen some of the kind of big show pieces that everybody sees all the time so many times. The Shining, God knows how many times, 2000 on a Space Odyssey. So whilst I know that these films are great and people, lots of people want to go and see them, there are other films, I think, that aren't shown enough. Barry Lyndon isn't shown enough. The Killing isn't shown enough. And Paths of Glory isn't shown enough. And it's a brilliant film. Um, that's why, really. It's a brilliant film. It's short enough. And it, not enough people get to see it because... Okay. Let's okay. start changing that uh, today. Thank you again, Richard Daniels. And uh, we will now have the uh, projection starting. Um, Pramila Chanchana is uh, our chief projectionist doing tonight's performance. And thank you also to Christian Appelt for his technical support. And if there are any questions left or any comments to Richard, he will be uh, pleased to answer them in the foyer afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>